inside. I have changed dramatically over my lifetime. <laughs> I imagine you have too. I am the second daughter of four. My older sister was the boss. Our mother worked full time. Because my father was bipolar, we lived in chaos a lot of the time. During my high school years, my parents divorced and we moved to another city. I started college there and realized that I was terribly insecure, fearful, and pretty smart. How I wish I had achieved some counseling at that time. <laughs> Around 1973, just as I was beginning my teaching career, I met Bill, a professor at UNCG. We married in 1975, and over the years we have grown and learned from one another. We were both interested in new ideas, and enrolled in courses that opened our minds and hearts to new ideas. We learned new ways to be with people, new ways to think about our lives, and new ways to be open and loving. Wisdom comes from growing and changing. We are not born with wisdom, but we can acquire it. In order to acquire it, however, we need to open ourselves to new ways of thinking, acting, and feeling. As Michelle Obama says, there's power in allowing yourself to be known and heard, in owning your unique story, in using your authentic voice. And there's grace in be, being willing to know and hear others. The road to, be, to wisdom begins when we become aware that we need to change, but do not know how to go forward in our lives. We tried different, different strategies to see what might help. On a whim, Bill and I enrolled in a course called the Silva Method, which was popular in the 70s. Attending their lectures was fun, entertaining, and challenging. We learned to slow our brains to the alpha level in order to use visualization and imagination. We didn't really believe it would work, but it did. We actually sold a house on Plummer Drive by using the Silva method. Another course we took was by Jack Canfield, who sold a series of self-improvement tapes called Self-Esteem and Peak Performance. We learned how to get what you want in life by letting go of fear. When to learn from criticism and when and how to ignore it. How to muster the courage to stand up for what you know is true and how to hold on to your self-esteem after a big failure. Much later, we participated in the landmark forum class called Living Life Powerfully and Living a Life I Love. At Landmark Forum classes, I learned to create new possibilities for myself and my life that transformed my outlook and encouraged me to drop old habits of thinking. I gave up thinking of myself as a failure, identified my strong suits, and tried out many new ways of thinking and acting. Because a landmark forum allowed us to interact with lots of other people who were there for the same reason, we were able to benefit and learn from the thoughts and actions of a variety of people from all walks of life. Here at UUCG, we and many of you studied the works of Marshall Rosenberg, the originator of nonviolent communication. Marshall showed us how to see ourselves and others from an entirely new perspective 
he led us to pay close attention to the words we use and the words others use. Many of you have studied Rosenberg's work and found a new way to communicate that leads us to give from the heart. The four components of new nonviolent communication are observations, concrete actions we observe that affect our well being, feelings, how we feel regarding what we need, needs, the values and desires that create our feelings and requests, the concrete actions we uh, request in order to enrich our lives. Nonviolent communication fosters deep listening, respect and empathy and engenders a mutual desire to give from the heart. Some people use NVC to respond compassionately to themselves. Some to create greater depth in their personal relationships and still others to build effective relationships at work or in the political arena. If you would like to know more about NBC, look in our library for Rosenberg's book, Nonviolent Communication, A Language of Life. Bill and I learned about Reiki from a young Dutch lady, Anandini Dasi, who was living in Greensboro at the time. Reiki is laying on of hands, a touch healing system. Anandini gave Bill Reiki after he broke his neck in an accident in 2003. Bill's experiences impelled him to study Reiki healing and he eventually became a Reiki master. I too studied Reiki with Anandini and several of our congregation members have also studied Reiki. Let me tell you about a remarkable experience I had with Reiki. After suffering a serious attack of pancreatitis, I received a Reiki treatment from a group of people you might know, Alison Dunmore, Kate Cheney, Anandini herself, and Liz Grimes. They volunteered to work together, giving me Reiki. While receiving Reiki from this remarkable group, I had a fantasy or a dream which lasted throughout the treatment. I saw my body as a spaceship made up as many rooms in which various activities were being performed by a myriad of tiny cells. I was able to roam through these rooms and observe what was taking place. This was a powerful experience that helped me realize that my body is a complex organism which was receiving healing in many different ways. When the treatment was complete, I was overcome with gratitude to these wonderful healers. And since then, I have been exploring the miniature universe that I am. In closing, I would like to read a quotation from the Daily Om, inspirational readings you can receive daily in your email box. Quote, in a world of six billion people, it's easy to believe that the only way to initiate profound transformation is to take extreme action. Each of us, however, carries within us the capacity to change the world in small ways for better or worse. Everything we do and think affects the people in our lives and their reactions in turn affect others as the effect of a seemingly insignificant word passes from person to person. Its impact grows and can become a source of great joy, inspiration, anxiety, or pain. Our thoughts and actions are like stones dropped into still waters, causing ripples to spread and expand as they move outward. The impact you have on the world is greater than you could ever imagine. And the choices you make 
can have far-reaching consequences. You can use the ripple effect to make a positive difference and spread waves of kindness that will wash over the world. Thank you for listening. recognize members of our choir singing Wake Now My Senses. The others were from the Chapel Hill UU Church. I never expect to find wisdom in a fortune cookie, but recently I pulled out this little gem. A human being is a deciding being. And it did make me contemplate the millions of decisions we make throughout our lives. Most are inconsequential. Coffee or tea? the blue shirt or the gray. You could have chosen to skip church today, have it for bed. <laughs> Other choices can change the course of our lives for good or ill, what to major in, where to live, what to believe. Robert Frost's poem, The Road Not Taken, beautifully captures the human dilemma. You come to a fork in the road of life, which path do you choose? The well-worn, tried and true, Millions of us do just that until we realize, you know what, this choice doesn't work for me. We might stick it out for a time until it gets unbearable enough that we finally heed that inner voice nudging us toward a different road, even if it, even if it seems harder. In Frost's words, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. We who have chosen this UU faith are prime examples. 
Having left our former religions, we find refuge here among open-minded spiritual seekers. I call us religious refugees. My own spiritual journey began in the Christian Science Church of Mary Baker Eddy. Although I rejected her religion in my teens, I still so hold some of its principles dear, especially Mrs. Eddy's assertion that as a being made in God's image, man is not material, he is spiritual. Her philosophy was summed up in a saying of Jesus, ye shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Finding the truth, that came to be a guiding principle for my life. In this age of rampant misinformation, disillusionment can drown out youthful trust and people that turn out to be not so trustworthy. We all must ultimately decide for ourselves what is true and what isn't. Experience can be a harsh teacher though, can't it? Trying and rejecting one false path after another can be exhausting. An element of discernment, discrimination is called for to feel at least somewhat confident that you're making the best choice for you. Which brings me to the famous serenity prayer. Lord, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the strength to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Wandering the wilderness of ignorance, I wondered, could a Galilean carpenter who lived over 2000 years ago have been the only trustworthy beacon of truth in all of human history? I combed through a lot of books with titles like The Mystical Life of Jesus, Seeking Answers. Eventually I realized it's not the teacher that matters so much as the teachings. Once I realized wisdom could be found in other books besides the Bible and other masters besides Jesus, huge spiritual vistas opened before me. Fast forward to 1980 when I joined this church, which encourages a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. What a welcome change from those that demand we believe doctrines that don't truly resonate during my second year here, I heard about Ira Progoff's intensive journal workshop, a way of moving past blocks and finding truths you really can believe in. I arranged to bring a presenter to our church for a weekend. The exercises involved dividing your life into categories like work, relationships, body, and composing dialogues with each. We were taught first to meditate our way into the alpha state of consciousness that Sue talked about earlier, gateway to inner wisdom. I'm a wordsmith with intuitive inclinations, so the process was a good fit for me. The exercise that impressed me the most was called dialogue with your wisdom figure. You meditate on the concept of wisdom and turn it into a being you know will speak the truth get a clear image of that wise being and write a description. Then remaining in alpha, write your question. What am I meant to do? What is the source of this longing I feel? Whatever it is. And then you wait, listening deeply within for an answer from the wise one. We were encouraged not to second guess or censor ourselves, just allow the answers to well up and form words. And sure enough, it happened. A few tentative words at first, but the more I trusted the process, the more came. Soon they were flowing from my pen so fast I could hardly keep up with them. And there it was, the wisdom I had been seeking right there in my journal. It had been inside me all along. It assured me my spiritual aspirations were not imaginary. imaginary full speed ahead. I have employed this method periodically ever since, whenever I can't quite uncover answers otherwise. And where does that wisdom come from? The instructor likened us each to a well. When you dig deep enough, it connects you to what Progoff called an underground stream of pure wisdom flowing throughout the universe. My guru put it this way, thoughts are universally 
not individually rooted. The human mind is a spark of God's almighty consciousness. Intensive journaling is one of a number of effective ways to tap into that divine wisdom. Again, you must get into the proper state of receptivity first in order to get to the true truth. We've all been there. When some insight or idea seems to pop into your mind from nowhere, and you know it's right, helpful, maybe even life-changing. Meditation is a way of summoning that wisdom intentionally rather than waiting for it to show up at random. Now, just because we can discover answers inside ourselves doesn't mean we shouldn't look beyond ourselves for guidance. This church, for one, lots of food for thought here. Hundreds of enlightened masters have shared their wisdom over the centuries, and of course, scriptures. My intuition kept nudging me to find the perfect teacher for me. Along the way, I discovered a scripture I've come to love even more than the Bible, packed with all manner of wisdom. The Bhagavad Gita confirmed my hunch. The verse, find a wise teacher, ask him your questions, serve him. Someone who has seen the truth will guide you on the path to wisdom. At age 38, I did find the perfect guru for me. The Indian master, Paramahansa Yogananda, an incarnation of divine love, passed from this world in 1952, but his shining spirit lives on in his voluminous writings, his organization, Self-Realization Fellowship, and his autobiography of a yogi. When I read it in 1988, I immediately recognized the liberating truths it related so eloquently. Growing up in India, Yogananda had sought out a wide array of yogis and sages, knowing one was meant to be his guru. He finally found him. It was Swami Sri Yukteswar. Here's a picture of him. And he was an incarnation of wisdom, a fully liberated master who stated firmly, humanity as seen by a master is divided into only two classes, the ignorant who are not seeking God and the wise who are. Yogananda had no doubt that Yukteswar was the perfect guru for him. That was just how I felt after reading his autobiography. Paramahansa Yogananda's brilliant explanations of spiritual truths far surpassed any others I had encountered till then. When I chose him as my guru, I did not reject other great ones whom I still honor. In essence, they all teach the same truths, the only difference being emphasis and language. There are more similarities in their teachings than differences. In 1920, Yogananda was sent to spread the wise teachings of yoga to America. This excerpt from his writings explains the difference between wisdom and knowledge. Wisdom is intuitive insight, not intellectual understanding. The difference between human knowledge and divine wisdom is that the human mind comes at things indirectly from without. The scientist, for example, investigates the atom objectively, but the yogi becomes the atom. Divine perception is always from within. From within alone can a thing be understood in its true essence. Close quote. I hasten to add, this does not negate our clearly useful intellects. It simply places intuition on an equally lofty perch where it belongs. It's a long way from finding a guru to mastering his teachings. Years of devoted practice are required, and few of us have that kind of discipline. That's why we must not discard our guru prematurely. What I have, have is priceless, sources of truth given by true masters, and intuition I have learned to trust. From Jesus came knowledge, what to look for, the kingdom of heaven, as he called it, and where to find it within. Yogananda supplied the wisdom and the crucial how, a proven meditation technique called Kriya. Yoga may not be your cup of tea, but here's what I learned from my experience, study, 
journaling and meditation. Your longing for truth will eventually lead you to the path that is just right for you if you make a sincere effort and take nothing for granted out of blind faith. Having plugged into a reliable source of wisdom, choices become clearer. The wisdom to know the difference between truth and falsehood, acceptance and resistance is available to all once we make that initial choice to seek it. Please join us now in singing hymn number 131, Love Will Guide Us. Some wisdom from Ken Knight, our resident Buddhatarian. Hello. I think I'm unmuted. I'm seldom muted. I like to talk a lot, as you know. <laughs> uh, <I'm laughs> I have been in flattered and uh, to be honored by asking you to share my wisdom. I uh, used to aspire to be a wise elder, but I think I've had to settle for being a wise guy. So here I am. I'm living in a retirement community with people who are old enough to be my parents. I'm a youngster here at 77. And even though I feel young most of the time, I guess I am an elder in the eyes of many people, especially you youngsters out there in the audience. I'm reluctant to claim that I've been blessed because claiming that seems arrogant to me, that God might have singled me out as special. I prefer to self consider myself lucky. I'm lucky that I was born a white male in 1943 in the height of white supremacy in this country. I'm also lucky to have been born healthy and have raised, been raised in a stable family where I had access to good schools, adequate health care, and safe places to live. I was born on third base, and I know I did not hit a triple. I know I do not deserve the privileged life that I have any more than anyone else. I will claim to be, be blessed by many things that have happened in my life, many choices I've been able to make because of my lucky place, time and place of birth. I've been blessed by marrying Mary Alice and raising our son Johnny to be a good father and an all-around good man. I've been blessed by the opportunity to serve in the Peace Corps where I developed an appreciation of a culture that was very different from my own. I have been very blessed by discovering Unitarian Universalism while I was in college. I belong to six different UU communities, and I've been exposed to many amazing ideas and have known some astonishing people because of this connection. 
I've been blessed by discovering social work. I worked in community mental health and public in the public school system for uh, 35 years. I have a lot of excellent training and many gratifying experiences that have become part of who I am. And I am grateful to my friend Al Brilliant, who helped introduce me to Thich Nhat Hanh. Thich Nhat Hanh's version of Buddhism has become part and parcel of who I am, and I've had been fortunate enough to go to four retreats with uh, Thich Nhat Hanh. So the conclusions that I've reached from all these various experiences that I was lucky enough to have are as follows. One of the main gifts I've gotten from being a Buddhitarian is being comfortable with the likelihood that this life is it. It's the only one I will have. I believe in life before death. If I'm going to experience heaven or hell, it will be here while I'm alive. Paradise is a state of mind, not a place. Happiness or heaven on earth can be cultivated here and now, not found out there somewhere. I think the most important task of my life is to be happy. That may sound selfish and hedonistic, but true happiness comes from being grateful for the miracles of life and being kind and generous to my fellow beings. I've been teaching a class called The How of Happiness based on a book by the, of that title by Sonia Leah Vermirsky. Here's what she summarizes in a nutshell as the source of happiness. The fountain of happiness can be found in how you behave, what you think, and the goals you set for yourself every day of your life. Every day above ground is a good day. And I can make each day better by intentionally being grateful. I am grateful for the miraculous nature of being alive, for being healthy and strong enough to live consciously. I have learned from Buddhism to be grateful for the things that we tend to take most for granted. Breathing, seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, the commonplace miracles of life that we're surrounded by at all times. Buddhism and psychology have taught me uh, something very important, that most of my actions and most of my responses, most of how I, what I do is rooted in, more in how I think than what happens outside me. All events are neutral. Nothing in the world has meaning without a living being assigning a meaning to it. When I am mindful of my judgments, I realize that there are many possible reactions to stressful events. And sometimes I can choose a helpful response rather than a reaction. I've learned to listen to the practice of meditation to my monkey mind. And to know that most of my actions are determined by these crazy judgments of my monkey mind. The more conscious of my judgments, the more power I have to make choices in response to what is going on around me. Much of my happiness comes from being um, having meaningful things to do. I was a social worker and I still am, even though I'm retired. Before the pandemic, I was a volunteer one day a week at Mustard Seed Clinic, serving as an interpreter and case manager for Dr. Beth Mulberry. And at least one day a week, I spent with the wonderful Pompo children, refugees from Africa that this church has embraced. I look forward to getting back to them. I also take time to play and have fun. I play disc golf, ride my bicycle, and try to be a good companion to Mary Alice and my neighbors here at this retirement community where I live. One of the, the people in my life that's had uh, a lasting impact on me uh, was uh, Dean Shelton. Dean Shelton wore a hat like this frequently. He frequently wore all kinds of extravagant uh, garb. And Dean taught me that if you wear funny clothes, you get smiled at a lot. It's true. And it makes the day so much better going through the day being smiled at instead of frowned at. Thank you, Dean. Uh, your memory lives on with me and probably a lot of the older people in the church. So I know that I will die someday and I will probably go into decline as I approach death. 
reminding myself of this reality has led me to choose a comfortable, safe place for Mary Alice and me to spend the last parts of our life. I've planned as well as I know how for the end of life by, by using a wonderful document called the Five Wishes, in which I can detail out exactly as much as possible how I want to be treated at the end of my life. I've also become part of setting up the first natural burial ground here in Greensboro at St. Barnabas Episcopal Church. I'm very fortunate. I have a safe place to live and all my basic needs met. I have lots of people that I love and I feel loved by many people. In spite of the problems in my life and the suffering that I see around me, I am happy with my life. If this is all there is, this is enough. I do believe in life before death. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. One of the ways that we live out our mission is to create, to create loving community is to contribute financially to the ministries of this congregation and to the good work of our community <laughs> partners. Our offering for the time being goes to Greensboro Mutual Aid. We believe that ordinary people can make a difference, that most everyone have, has a hard time sometimes and that the lack of an appropriate federal response to this pandemic has rendered even more people even more vulnerable. We know that it did not have to be this way, but since it is, we will do our part to fill the gap. If you'd like to make a contribution via PayPal to the church for our offering to be split, you can do so at the link in our chat and indicate COVID in the memo line. You can also mail a check. Our offering will now be gratefully received. joys and sorrows. Spirit of life, we gather in gratitude for this life and this morning. We celebrate joys which are meaningful when they're shared. If there is a word of joy on your heart, you may lift it up in silence or type it in the chat. Help me. 
I can't. I can't find the chat. Okay, I found it. <laughs> I hope everyone has had a joyful Christmas, even though perhaps a little more understated than usual this year. Donna Scheidt says, joyful for this community and the opportunity to be together, whether by Zoom or winter solstice. Mark's playing. Sharon Francis, I got to visit and see my granddaughter. That's wonderful. Her new apartment, Christmas day. Grateful we are all sticking together. Harold Gunn had a wonderful Christmas with some family, no expectations. It was wonderful to see family members over Zoom that we have not seen in a long time. I think everybody has, <laughs> a lot of us have had that. Thank goodness for Zoom. Family, friends, and sharing. Christmas break with our immediate family, Zooming with distant family members. And more zooming with